All right, well, I think we can get started now. I am recording. And so hello, everybody. Uh, welcome here. Thank you for coming. Happy to have the opportunity to host this um, in participation with UMIEEE. Uh, if you are an electrical or computer engineering student and you would like to know more about UMIEEE or get involved, uh, you can either ask Brendan or myself or um, I think the, the email for the group should be in uh, your agenda or online. You should probably be able to find it. Um, it's a great place to hang out. We have a great lounge space and a great lab space as well in there uh, for electrical and computer engineering students and, and any any uh, discipline you can join. Definitely, even if you're outside the faculty, you can join as well. Um, anybody can use the lab space who's a member and uh, you can, we have a number of oscilloscopes, spectrum analyzers, lots of soldering supplies and a whole host of other things in there uh, that you can access. So something else that UMIEEE does is uh, put on these presentations. So I did, and some of you maybe remember, I did a, a presentation on Ultium in the uh, in the fall semester for uh, with to do with circuit design, and I had wanted to do some sort of presentation on the uh, Canadian electrical code uh, the, whole, the whole year. So now we have that chance to do that. So I'm happy to be here and happy to be able to present this to all of you. So I'm going to switch off my video just because that will hopefully keep the fan noise down. And uh, we can get started here. So, yeah, thanks everybody. And the, uh, yeah, just we can jump right into it. So, this is the cover of the 2021 code. Um, and this is going to be an introduction to the Canadian Electrical Code Part 1 for students. So, a little bit of what, what we're going to go over. Um, and we'll first go over a brief introduction to what the code is, how it works, why it exists, whatnot. Uh, we'll go over the sections of the code. So there's general sections and amending sections, and I'll talk about what those are. An overview of some of the tables in the code that you may actually, um, you may use. And some calculation examples, uh, we'll do some of those at the end, or one or two anyways. If you have any questions, um, please interrupt me, uh, raise your hand, do whatever you want, or we can have a question period at the end um, to go over that. So I think to get started, I want to say that um, I offer a bit of a disclaimer in the sense that I want to give uh, kind of an introduction to um, why, why, firstly, why, of course, why we have the code, what it is, what it does, that sort of thing, but also just um, to make sure that we all understand that it's it, um, using the code and learning how to use the code is something that takes, that happens over a number of years. I mean, if you go into um, consulting or in a, a line of work where you're you're using the code and you're designing um, uh, electrical installations often or every day or all the time right this is something that happens over your course um, you know over many years even decades um, as uh, as your skill set develops so you shouldn't take anything I say today as licensed to now go off and, and design your own electrical systems or something like that it's something that has to you have to be um, to work with and, and you have to get to a certain competency level to to become um, familiar with the code and the, and the regulations and the rules and, and how everything works together. So um, a little bit just of a background of how this would work in a consulting um, setting is where you would, once you graduate, you become an EIT. Um, you would go into a line of work such as consulting where you'd be working with the code every day, designing, most days designing, um, doing calculations, designing electrical installations for commercial buildings, industrial buildings, um, landscape, parks, etc., whatever you might be doing. Um, and then after four years of, of doing that and becoming and being mentored by a professional engineer, uh, you would then, and rating all the progress reports and whatnot, you would then get your, your PNG designations. Everybody knows that, I'm sure. But uh, that's, you again, the same thing applies to competency just in electrical engineering in general. The same thing would apply to um, the code is once, you know, you, it's, it's something that you gain competency in and gain familiarity with over the years. So I just want to make sure we all understand that, that it's, uh, it's something that you learn as you go. But why I'm doing this tonight is I am a little bit dumbfounded, and I have been for a number of years, as to why we don't, as engineers, learn more about the electrical code in, in engineering school here at the U of M. It's something that electrical code is so important, not just to people who design buildings and um, and electrical systems for, for large structures and buildings and whatnot, but really to... to hold, um, all types of electrical engineering should have people who are working all types of electrical engineering jobs rather should have some understanding of 
how the code is and how it affects what you do. Because even if you're designing, um, say, some you know, microwave amplifier or something like that, you still, that has 120 volt power input or maybe even a larger power input, depending on how big the amplifier is, you still need to have, you know, that, that, that power coming into the device. Maybe it's 120 volts, 208 volts, 600 volts, whatever it is. You still need to have that power going into the device and that you have to do that, that, that power input to the device safely and you have to handle the, the power in the device safely. And I'll talk about, a little bit about what regulations manufacturers need to um, stand by. But those are it's just a brief example of how it's something that really should be taught, in my opinion, taught to everybody, all electrical engineers, regardless of um, you know what, what you end up doing. We all have to learn a whole heck of a lot about circuits why don't we have one little mention or you know snippet of information about the electrical code because it's so important not everybody everybody in the has to graduates from electrical engineering should be f fairly familiar with circuits but i feel that there's a lot that we get taught that is not as general as for example the code so anyways, that's a bit of my opinion but anyways uh, we can get into the uh, the definitions here um the CEC, or Canadian Electrical Code, I'll probably just refer to it as the code from now on, um, is a, a Canadian National Master Standard. It's um, a part of the um, Standards Committee of Canada, or SCC, that is written by the Canadian Standards Association, or CSA, um, the CSA Group for Adoption and Enforcement by Regulatory Authority. So the CSA Group doesn't do any regulation or enforcement um, themselves, the they publish the code and it is there for uh, adoption by regulatory authorities. So regulatory authorities may be a utility like Manitoba Hydro, they might be a municipality, it might be a city. Um, so in Manitoba, we have two regulator, regulatory authorities, I believe, the city of Winnipeg and Manitoba Hydro. So the both of those jurisdictions, if so, if you're in Winnipeg, it's the city of Winnipeg. Anywhere else in the province, it's Manitoba Hydro. If you, um, so both of those, those jurisdictions adopt the code for their own use and they will issue amendments. So um, if you're for Manitoba, it's the Manitoba Electrical Code. And if you're in Winnipeg, it's the city of Winnipeg Electrical Bylaw. And that, um, the, it's essentially a document that um, has, it's much smaller than the actual code document, but it is, it lists some amendments that might cater to specifics um, for the climate of the area, for the regulation, regulatory kind of uh, structure of the area, the, the existing um, bylaws that are in place, that sort of thing um, is, is usually what it does. Not, a, not as many technical changes you'll see in the amendments. It's more to do with the regulatory stuff. So the CEC also meets the uh, kind of international standards from IEC, and it's harmonized to other North American electrical codes, such as the NEC, which is the, the USA electrical code, and the Mexican electrical code as well. So, which means that a manufacturer who makes a receptacle for Canada, it all they can sell it everywhere. It's kind of, it's the same. It's not like it's completely different in um, the US as, um, and Canada, as we know, it's a very similar electrical system. Um, there are five parts of the code. So you'll see this dot one or parts called we refer to electrical code as part one. Um, part one is the one that is regularly used by engineers and that's when we kind of colloquially refer to as the code. Um, we, the other parts are on the next page here, but um, part one directly regulates the electrical design and construction standards and rules and um, best practices of, that are used every day by engineers and electricians. So parts of the CEC, part one, as I just talked about, part two sets is used by manufacturers and that sets out the minimum standards for electrical equipment, electrical boxes, cables, receptacles, uh, disconnect switches, transformers, you name it. Uh, anything that's electrical, there's, I think there's like uh, over 200 different um, individual kind of um, standards within part two of the CEC. It's not one book actually, you actually have to buy individual standards for, uh, for different things that in the electrical system. So it's, um, which is good because you don't want to buy the whole thing if you don't have to, because it would be very expensive to do that. Um, so it's a, essentially part two is a, essentially a collection of documents. Part three is, has to do with um, overhead line construction uh, adopted by a provincial body responsible for line construction. So in Manitoba, that would be Manitoba Hydro would adapt that, 
adopt that and um, and probably amend it slightly for their own use. Um, not really something that is encountered um, all the time by engineers, I would say, maybe unless you're working for a utility like um, Hydro. Part four is magnetic interference uh, rules. I have never even seen this or don't really know what exactly what it covers, but that's what it is. And part five is rules to do with mines. So mines have very different electrical systems and kind of electrical situations than um, uh, than your average kind of installation. They may operate at much higher temperatures. They obviously operate at higher pressures being underground. There's a lot more um, environmental uh, hazards and environmental um, considerations that have to be dealt, dealt with mines. And same with uh, the kind of the, the classifications and how heavy duty the wiring and the the cables and uh, the electrical equipment is has to be a lot more um, heavy duty in a mine because of all the wear and tear that they that they go through. So that's a different part. And again, no matter the part, the general purpose of the code is safety, where electricity is generated, transported, or used. So whatever, however, electricity you come into contact with any sort of electricity um, that I would say is more of a high voltage um, type, maybe above 30 volts, and you're gonna see some rule for that in the code, or the code is gonna be dealing with that. So a little snippet of overview of the commercial, more so the commercial industrial electrical industry in Canada. Now I, I mean, by commercial industrial, I mean to exclude utilities. That's not really what I'm covering here. Utilities are a different thing, um, not, not related to what we're gonna be talking about today. So. Here's the code at the top here. We have engineers such as you and me who are gonna be graduating. We, some of us may be working with the code all the time, maybe somewhat infrequently, but in any case, um, if, you're, if you're designing electrical installations, uh, you're gonna be working with the code um, in some way, shape or form. Electricians have a lot to do <clears throat> with that as well. Now, I actually <laughs> forgot to put an arrow in here. I, I think I deleted it and I re didn't reinsert it that there should be an arrow um, between, let's go down here and put that in. Um, there should be an arrow between engineers and electricians. Very important as well. And there we go. So electricians, of course, are the people uh, who do some, they may do some design depending on the size or scale of the job, but they essentially take and a large part the uh, commercial industrial jobs, the plans and the designs that engineers and engineering firms will draw up and publish. Um, and not included in here, but um, implied are the technicians and the drafts people and everybody else at a consulting firm that might um, pitch in to make the design actually come, come to fruition. But electricians take those designs, they work with the code, that um, the rules that are set out in the code governing the actual installation, not just the design of um, electrical systems, but the actual installation of electrical systems. They work with those rules that are in the code. They work with the drawings that have come from engineers and they make a electrical installation. They actually build this, the installation. Engineers influence the installation, installation obviously through the design and the, um, the amount of safety, the redundancy, reliability, what have you, that's built into the design. Both engineers and electricians um, use the code and so do manufacturers. Manufacturers obviously make the stuff that electricians install, both electricians and engineers, um, but more so engineers, specify that equipment and electricians and engineers both give feedback to manufacturers on the equipment, how well it's working, things that should be changed, um, and manufacturers often will um, uh, come up with and release uh, products that are driven by the feedback that is given to them from engineers and electricians. Everything, all of this comes together to create a safe and reliable electrical installation. You'll notice though that I have not put, and of course manufacturers have to use, um, going back to part two of the code, this I guess is, should say part two as well, but manufacturers um, have to use part two and part one to a degree to, um, to make the equipment. Everybody following along, any questions at this point? No, okay. So you'll notice here that I haven't included an arrow from the code to a safe and reliable electrical installation. You may be wondering why that is. Well, the reason behind that is because the code on its own does not guarantee a safe and reliable electrical installation. It is our um, 
understanding and enforcement and well not enforcement but understanding and adoption and um, the and putting the code into effect in our designs as engineers that actually guarantees a safe and reliable electrical installation we could take the the code is just a book right we could throw it out the window and say to hell with that we're going to design whatever we want which would be professional negligence of course um but without the the point of that is that without actually us understanding how the code works and knowing how to apply it to the designs properly um there's no point so that's it's on of course on the the burden is on the engineers to make the design right and the electricians to install it correctly and that and safe manufactured items to create a safe and reliable electrical installation so a little bit of history of the code it was first published in 1927 it's been updated many times since and nowadays it's updated every three years most recently in 2021 so the update before that was in 2018 and 2015 and so on it's actually released one year after the NEC, America's Code, as I, as, I, um, as I mentioned. So some of the updates that are in the NEC kind of get transferred over to the CEC. Um, some of them, not all of them, there are some differences, but they're generally, the CEC kind of follows the general, maybe some changes in the NEC. And the code is a product of many, many women and men who have put their time and experience and expertise into producing this ex excellent document that we use all the time. And as I was saying, when used, understood, and applied properly, creates a safe and reliable electrical installation. It is our code, and we should be proud of it. Um, the Canadian code is well regarded around the world as a very, very uh, safe and strong um, code for uh, for the safety electrical systems. And it's actually adopted in many countries uh, around the world who are you know small countries that might not want to put their own um, work into developing the whole code, but they might kind of just say, "Okay, we're going to use the Canadian code." Um, and maybe change it a little bit for our our area, the uh, geography, the climate, what have you, uh, the, the voltage that's generated or whatever. But we're going to take, by and large, we're going to take that code and we're going to use it. So, yeah, okay, that's a little bit of introduction. So now we'll get a little bit into the, uh, the meat and potatoes here. I'm going to be referencing back and forth from the, I have the 2018 code. I'm going to give this to all of you. I'll put it, the link, uh, the file in the chat here um, in a second. And well, why don't I do that just now? And you can all open it up. Um, so this was actually rep, um, obtained through the university. The university has a CSA group subscription. You can um, you can go on there and you can see all the every single um, CSA um, document, not just this code, but like all of the um, all of the Let's see here. Let's that. Um, all of the like, are one, two, three, four, five. Um, I think I think you can get it um, from that subscription. And there we go. Okay. Uh, and you can you can view them. Unfortunately, they changed this a few years ago. You can't download them anymore, which is stupid. Um, they it's yeah so. Anyways, you should be able to download them, but they are money hogs, I suppose, and they're, they want to get you to pay for it eventually, even though we're all new students. So there you go. You can download that. Um, but so this was downloaded a few years ago when, when they still allowed you to, to download it um, and keep it for yourself. But you can, as long as you're on campus, you can, um, I think you can view them from wherever, but as long as you're on campus, you can download it. So this is obviously the 2018 code. Like I said, there's the 2021 code now. Um, there are a number of changes, but for the purposes of what we're doing tonight and for your own reading, I think, um, they're, it, they are similar enough that you can kind of use them. The, 28, the 2021 code, I think, costs about $180. Um, so here, I'll show you. I have the book here. This is the, this is the code book. That thick. It's pretty, pretty beefy. It has a very nice... Um, ring binding here so you can open it up flat which is really important and you can you know turn it over read it uh, and so it's 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 i would say that it is much nicer to have when you're leaving through it and you have to go back and forth from things like there are actual links in the pdf version but it's really nice to have the um this version as well and oh, get 
Wait one second. When you buy it from CSA, when you buy the paper version, you get this really cute um, uh, handbook. Well, not, not a handbook. The handbook is something different. I'll cover that later. But this little quick reference guide that has um, lots of very important information, not just related to the code, but like all kinds of electrical stuff, mainly geared to electricians. Like they have like various, um, what is this? Open Delta configuration, Y configuration uh, for transformers, winding connections, how to set up grounding electrodes and that sort of thing. So, um, it, but it's, it's pretty useful if you need to do some quick calculations. So, okay. So general versus amendment, amending sections. There are, I think, 86 sections. Let me double check that. 86 sections in the code. And um, so, uh, there is, well, actually, that's not true. There's not 86. Some of them have been deleted, I think. Um, yes, Daniel, the digital version I just sent is part one. So I don't have, I don't think I have any of the other parts. Um, again, they really don't really need them. Um, yeah, no worries. Um, for what you're going to be for, like, you know, you wouldn't need them necessarily. Some part, some um, uh, types of, some of the part two ones, depending on what you're doing, you might need to, you're specifying different parts, but generally part one is the, is what's most often used. That contains kind of the whole thing, everything you need. Pardon me, uh, for, uh, for, for doing your, your work. So, yeah, section 0 to 8 to 16 are, and section 26 are the general sections. They set out the basic, the baseline rules of the electrical code. They are the rules that in um, generally in all installations, you're going to be following those rules, depending on what you're doing. Um, well, depending on what you're doing, you might be using different rules in those sections, but you're going to be following those rules. All the other sections amend or supplement them. So, um, well, we'll go over it a little bit later, but an, an example of an amending section would be like, um, you know, uh, stuff to do with elevators or lifts, escalators, um, community antenna distribution, electric heating systems, um, renewable energy systems, uh, like electrical requirements for um, like trailers and trailer parks, airports, um, like the feeders, boathouses, that sort of stuff that are kind of more um, once in a while kind of things. So they'll, they will amend um, either relax, maybe relax the rules, although not normally, uh, or add other rules or different rules that will need to be followed in those cases. So each section has a um, number of rules. The code uses, it's kind of interesting, the code uses almost exclusively even numbered sections, and that's uh, both sections and rules. Um, that's so that if they have to insert um, some rule or section, I suppose, although I don't think that's ever been done, uh, in between like three-year update periods, they can insert something as like an odd section. So it could be section four, rule 005 or something like that. Um, and then layout, like I said, there will be um, there's tables and appendices at the back. So section zero, and we'll go to the electrical code now. Hopefully everybody has it downloaded and uh, this kind of cruise through it uh, on your own uh, leisure. But um, we'll go to section zero here. So this is the object definitions, um, just kind of an introduction of the various definitions that are used in the code. Each section that has more specific definitions will list those. And you'll see here that there are some, um, you'll see there's a little delta symbol by some of these, um, some of these items. So a delta symbol indicates that this has been changed since the last update. So this, that the definition of a cable, I suppose, has been changed in the 2018 code versus the 2015 code. And yeah, lots of different types of definitions. And so section zero, unless you need to look up a definition, I, you don't, you're not gonna really go back and forth to it very much. Section two, general rules. This is pretty important. Um, in general, this section, has to do a lot with uh, how the 
regulatory process and the um, approval process works in a certain area, or this is why this is the section that's going to be amended most heavily in a in a local um, AHJ or authority authority having jurisdiction is going to amend this most heavily in general. Um, you can see here that there's like um, permitting application for inspection, the fees, the posting of the permit, um, how the inspection is going to happen, how your electricity is going to get reconnected after inspection has happened. So the inspection is somebody who's employed by, for example, the city of Winnipeg will come to your house or come to the business place or the, the new building or whatever, and they will inspect the electrical work that the electricians have done, and they will either certify it as yes, that's good, or no, you have to change X, Y, or Z. Um, and then there's some technical stuff. So this kind of man this kind of works into um, the manufacturers, like what uh, piece of each piece of electrical equipment has to have these markings on it. Warning, caution, markings, the ratings, and what types of voltages can be used in what areas. Um, that sort of thing. So very important rule here is more so for electricians, but also very important for um, engineers to know that quality of work, the mechanical arrangement and execution of work in connection with any electrical installation shall be acceptable. So that means that you're not running conduits at, you know, all 360 degrees and, and uh, you know, everything's kind of all helter skelter. Everything should be um, kind of true, plumb level, uh, straight to building lines, parallel, parallel, parallel with building lines, that sort of thing, right? You're not running conduits at all kinds of weird angles. It should be, you know, 90 degree bends, that sort of thing. So quality of work is very important, of course. Um, yeah, so this is section two. It's again, unless you're, these things are, are kind of, um, maybe I wouldn't say implied, but kind of very general. You don't have to come back to them. I don't, wouldn't say you'd come back to them very often. Section four is kind of the beginning of the actual um, stuff that the, the, the real um, technical rules that you're going to be following to, to do a design. So section four is on conductors. So that section four has to do mainly with the ampacity and sizing of wires and cables and how the temperature affects the ampacity. As we all know, the resistance of wire goes up when the temperature increases. So that is going to affect how much um, the, the current rating of the cable, how much current can the wire uh, handle. And of course, because we don't have superconductors, the more current you have down a wire, the, um, the resistance is going to generate heat. The heat is going to heat up the, cable, the wire. The resistance is going to increase from the increased heat. And, you know, it's this kind of positive feedback loop until it reaches some new equilibrium point. It also covers identification of wires, and then you, it directs, will direct you to a variety of cables, both tables giving ampacity values, such as um, these ones here, oops, uh, these ones here, one to four, and these other ones, which are used for more specialty cases, um, as well as correction factors. So we'll do an example at the end uh, here to do with conductor sizing, and you'll hopefully get a better idea of what table you're going to use in what uh, application or what situation and how to use correction factors for a variety of situations. I'll also mention that um, I'm not going to go super far in depth to this tonight because it's pretty easy to look up online, but there's a whole wide range of different types of um, cables that, and wires that you're going to find. You might see designations such as RW90, uh, Tech90, BX, TWN75, those are all different types of wires and cables. Um, that kind of sounds like jargon, and it kind of is, but as you, if you go into this sort of uh, work, you'll very quickly learn the different types of wires and cables and where they're used and what their properties are. Yeah, so that's conductors. If we go to section four here, we'll see um, uh, rule 4-004 here is definitely one of the most important rules in the whole book. It is like three pages long, and it covers all kinds of different um, wires, cables, and, and different installation configurations and how you might uh, calculate the ampacity at those different, um, uh, in those different configurations and even for different sizes as well. So for co copper and aluminum, of course, are the most two, um, I guess, really the only two uh, materials used for commercial industrial uh, wiring and of course aluminum cables are used in high voltage power transmission but those are not 
uh, covered in this um, document, of course. So the code has lots of different, we'll always have, you'll, you'll see whenever ampacity is, is mentioned, you're always going to see one, generally, you're always going to see one ampacity or one table for copper, one table for aluminum. So kind of keep that in the back of your mind. You got to always think about what conductor am I using? And you may be thinking, aluminum, well, didn't that burn a bunch of hoses down in the 1970s? Well, yes, it did. But that's because um, they, the code had not been properly kind of adapted at that point to cover the safe installation um, and regulate the safe manufacture of devices that um, are, are work properly with aluminum wire. Aluminum wire has a very large um, a coefficient of expansion with regards to temperature. So as temperature increases, as the wire gets hotter, as more current goes down it, um, it expands quite a bit. So when it contracts, it has now, if for example, you think of a wire under a screw, it's pushed up that screw. It's, it's, it's actually, the whole thing is um, expanded and the wire and the, the wire and the screw will actually have different coefficients of expansion. So as those, those expansion and contract, contraction cycles occur, eventually you're going to get um, some, some space, some gap between the wire and the screw. It's not going to be tight. And that extra heat from that gap will eventually cause a fire. So that's why those houses burn down. That doesn't happen anymore because partially because if you need to use aluminum wire, um, which is rarely if ever used in um, like small wiring in buildings, it's most often used in big feeders where the wire where the devices that you're terminating that wire into are actually rated for aluminum wiring. So it's very safe um, in if you're using the proper alloy. And the other thing is new alloys, aluminum alloys have been developed in the years since the 1970s. And that um, in, in a large part, as well as the, the proper device ratings have um, allowed the use, safe use of aluminum conductors nowadays. So essentially these white rules are copied in large part for aluminum and for copper. But of course it's a it's a accepted as a legal document uh, by those AHGAs. So it has to be kind of, it's written, you'll, you'll notice it's really written kind of in a legalese sense. It's not plain English really. So, and that's because it, it eventually becomes a legal document, more or less. I should also mention that um, you can get a variety of different, or well, there's two main different um, handbooks or books that will explain the code for you. Um, CSA Group publishes one, and the other one, which I have here with me, is um, the PS Knight Code um, Handbook. And that is actually very commonly used by electricians. It's a great book. It's also quite thick great book and it um does this is the commercial industrial version the residential version if you're doing your own house wiring is much smaller because it doesn't have to cover as much of course much smaller but it's also a, a great book um if you're doing your own wiring in your house but this is um has great explanations of a lot of stuff has great diagrams and um especially for if you're doing stuff at hazardous locations which we'll cover in a little bit or i'll explain about in a little bit um, it has a lot of great diagrams for everything that you need to do and kind of plain English examples for, um, for what may seem like a pretty confusing topic when you read the code. So um, definitely if you're doing a lot of electrical code work, maybe your employer might actually provide you a copy of the code so you don't need to buy the code, but I would really recommend buying the PS Knight um, handbook, the industrial one if you're doing commercial industrial work, um, or the CSA one. Uh, you can get a discount if you buy the, all the CSA the code and a handbook from them together, but I find that the um, PS Knight handbook is better. Anyways, that's a bit of a sidetrack there, but rule 4-004 is very important. Um, so you don't need to say any more than that. It is, it is very important. And it, in general, directs you to tables, as you can see here, table um, one or two or um, three or four depending on if you're using copper or aluminum. And we will go through those tables later. So yeah, that is conductors. Again, I'm doing a very brief overview here, but uh, don't I don't want to take up your whole evening. So section six is services and service equipment. So an electrical service is the single point where electricity enters a building or a structure. So the electrical service for your house is the mast, the service mast. If you have a house maybe in a slightly older area that has overhead distribution on your back lane, um, 120, 240 volt overhead distribution. So the service comes into your, it's, it's uh, comes down off the hydro pole or the hydro line in your back alley, 
comes onto your, if there's an attachment point onto your host and then it comes into the mast. And that is your, is your surface, that's your electrical surface. You're getting served the electricity by uh, the utility. If you live in a, maybe a slightly newer area or in uh, an area where there's, uh, you might have uh, underground distribution, you have a transformer serving a few different houses on your kind of front boulevard by the front street there and that you'll have underground distribution coming into your electricity meter on the side of your house. So in either case, the point, it's the end result, the electricity comes into the meter and then it comes into your panel board or your, your electrical panel in your house. So again, I emphasize it's the single point where an electricity enters a building. So it is very important that there's only one point of entry and that follows that there's one shutoff for the electricity entering your building, except in specific cases where you might have a very, very large building or something like, for example, an airport that needs multiple feeds of electricity or like one feed would just be like a kind of uh, not economical to have one massive, you know, feed for the whole building. Like I know that, uh, for example, Toronto Pearson Airport has multiple um, 25 kV feeds to the complex, even though it's more or less, you know, one complex that's kind of connected is, as I'm sure is, um, if you've flown through Toronto Pearson, it's a massive, massive place. There's, multiple, there's five terminals, and um, you can think of the huge amount of electricity that has to be used to power the planes and when they're on the ground and whatnot. So it is obviously not going to have one, you know, huge service um, at, you know, 230 kV or something like that. It would, it's much more, it doesn't just make sense to serve it at multiple um slightly lower voltage still 25 kV is nothing small it's pretty it's it's definitely a medium voltage service but it's not it just makes more sense to serve it through multiple points so that is an example where you're going to have one building that's still kind of now well, I don't want to call it one building but I suppose you don't have to, you can get through all the to all the buildings without going outside I suppose to find them it's the definition of a building kind of gets a little bit gray there but that's an example of one exception in general, though, you can only have one um, electrical service. So this definition also to, applies to uh, outbuildings fed from a main building that has a utility connection. So I um, do a lot of work or I volunteer for a facility that has a large number of outbuildings or one building is connected to the grid or as has the utility connection. And then that building feeds like 40 other different buildings. All those other buildings, those 40 other buildings still have a you know, the, the, the point of electricity entry to those buildings is still a service it by defined by the code, even though it's not a utility connection or another way of looking at it is a service um, is still a service, wherever that is, irregardless or regardless rather of the amount of fault current that's available at that building or at that location. You're going to be have much more fault current available at the utility connection, but much less of course, way down the line. Regardless, it's still a service way down the line. So um, that is, section six is only seven pages long. It's quite short, but it defines how you're going to, you know, where to put the service head, for example, the control and protective equipment. So what's called the service equipment, the service equipment is your main disconnect. Um, and then everything after that disconnect is the um, uh, is your, you know, your consumer's equipment, essentially. Um, other things, wiring methods, service conductors have to be protected um, because they are not fused. So above the main, you know, upstream of your main disconnect, if those conductors were to get harmed in some way, um, usually a service disconnect uh, upstream of your main disconnect will go to, if you have a utility connection, directly to a transformer. And um, there's nothing, as some of us, uh, some of you guys will know, there there depending on the size of your transformer you can have a whole lot of short circuit current available um at the output of your transformer and there's if there's nothing to there's and generally the transformer itself is not fitted with an with an overcurrent protection device so you can have a big arc flash big fire if you, those conductors somehow get uh, get harmed so the, the the service wiring is has to be protected it's very important for it to be protected uh, metering equipment is also um, covered, and that's pretty much it. Uh, section eight is circuit loading and demand factors. Circuit loading or demand factors, rather, I, I will say, is the um, the section eight defines a procedure so that you can calculate the demand or the the amount of 
um, the KVA demand that a building will exhibit when a new building will exhibit when it's uh, constructed, or you can use the dimensions of an existing building to calculate that as well. Like there's a pretty clear procedure in the code here for if, as a kind of a, um, a fun exercise, if you want to call it that. <laughs> you can go here, um, uh, rule 8-200 here is if you live in a, a house or uh, you live in an apartment, it defines different um, categories. You can actually calculate your, what is called calculated load for your house. You, it then defines kind of the, uh, the calculation procedure here. And that, that calculated load is then used to size, if it was a new house, for example, to size um, your surface size, which in Manitoba is generally either 100 amps or 200 amps. And that's the, that's the rating of your main breaker. So that's kind of an idea of how you use um, section eight here. You, it's, it's in, there's other parts here of um, rules for, for example, how many um, uh, branch circuit breaker positions you need in your main panel board um, for, a different, for a given panel board size. Um, and how the demand factors are used, that sort of thing. So it, um, it defines when a new building is generally being constructed. The designer, the electrician, the engineer um, has to know what size of service to, to, to design for. So this section actually outlines how, for example, if you're designing a new school, how do you decide, is it gonna be a, a 500 amp service? A, 200 amp service, 1000 amps, who knows? Well, this allows a kind of a general formula to um, to put all those um, those loads together that would most commonly be expected in um, in a school. Hospitals, hotels, motels, etc., and other types of occupancy. And then there's a table, um, table 14, that's used to uh, generate kind of your watts per square meter for various types of occupancies, restaurants, um, industrial facilities, offices, that sort of thing. Voltage drop is the other important thing that's defined uh, here in section eight. Uh, generally, the code defines um, a maximum of 3% voltage drop between a panel board or a load center, electrical panel. The, those terms are all synonymous essentially. Um, but, so 3% between the panel board and the load or the receptacle, or 5% between the service entrance, like we were talking about in the last section, and the receptacle. And then section eight also covers the rules for branch circuits, uh, how many receptacles can be on a branch circuit, that sort of thing. And the parking lot receptacles are also covered. So how many parking lot, what's the, what's the demand that you can expect for um, parking lots, the receptacles and parking lots, and um, what kind of, how many receptacles should be per breaker, how many, what's the load that you're gonna expect, like I was just saying, so. Those are all things that are covered in section eight. So section eight is used a lot of the time where you're designing a new building. You're gonna be referring to it a lot um, to come up with those estimated loads that you might be might, you might be looking for. So yeah, in pre-existing buildings and that have new construction is the same thing. Section 10 is grounding. So as we all know, grounding is connecting something to the earth. Um, and that, that is the definition that code uses is connecting electrical equipment kind of to an earth reference that should be theoretically zero volts. That is a reference that if it was hit by lightning, for example, you could drain off that, that current, that, that voltage to ground. Bonding is a different term. Bonding is connecting all the metal equipment, the, the, uh, the ground pin on your receptacle, the electrical box, the uh, the uh, the case of your power supply, if, the, if you have a metal case in your power supply, that sort of thing, that is bonding. All the all that metal um, infrastructure that is in the electrical system gets bonded together. That is the the term, and then that is connected back to ground at the main panel. So, two different terms. They do refer to slightly different things. Even, like depending on. For uh, what's called a solidly grounded system, as I as I said here, I won't talk about impedance grounded or ungrounded systems. They're a bit more confusing. But the majority of systems, for example, the systems in our houses and most commercial installations, are going to be solidly grounded systems where all those electrical parts and everything are connected to ground, so that if a, a live wire were somehow to tr to um, to touch the, um, the the ground, the box, the metal box, 
then it would be the current would be directed to ground and the circuit breaker would trip. And if, if it wasn't grounded, those boxes weren't grounded, um, then the current that those boxes would just become live would be raised to the potential of the um, of the, the whatever voltage that is, and you might get a shock. So um, section 10 kind of refer, talks about how that actually um, how that happens. Section 12 is also is one of the most important ones, and that is on wiring methods. So this um, talks about all different types of wiring methods, different cables you're using, different wires you're using, how to install them properly, how to install them um, you know, without damaging them, how to connect them to the electrical boxes, how they should be supported and all that sort of stuff. Regulations for running cables underground. Um, so it covers not just um, the different types of cables, but also um, different types of conduits that are used, how to install the, the different conduits and all, this, all that stuff. So it's like, I don't even know here, like 50 pages long. So definitely a long one, definitely a lot of information in there. I'm not going to go um, really in depth at all there, but um, if you're using a certain type of wiring system or conduit, you're going to want to look in there to actually get the rules of how does this have to be installed. And this applies a lot more to electricians. But um, depending on, um, you know, if, if you're specifying sizes of conduits and that sort of thing, sizes of wires, types of wires, how these different types of wires can be used, um, that's definitely there. For example, in MD90, regular, oops, regular house wiring, you can't direct bury that. You have to use a different type of wire, um, such as Tech90, for, for, for direct burial. So that's that sort of information is covered in... Uh, in section 12. As well, um, installations of boxes and fittings are also covered. So we go here. I don't know why it says deleted here. I think that's a typo. It's definitely not deleted. Um, so yeah, lots of lots of different um, uh, lots of different rules. So non-metallic sheath cable that is nmd90 that's the kind of the, the white wires you see in your in your house um, armored cables so that's like the you might see it like in a lot of um, commercial installations it's called bx or ac90 it's has a kind of wavy um, aluminum surface uh, they can be you can get steel armored cables as well but generally it's aluminum uh, and this is Covers, there's a whole wide range of different types of, blue, of armored cables that can be uh, obtained with overall plastic jackets, with plastic jackets inside, with different temperature ratings, different purposes, different uses. Um, you can get instrumentation and control cables that are armored and all that sort of stuff. So armored cables, very useful, very, um, uh, very, oh, what's the word? Um, flexible, you know, you can use it in a lot of different types of situations. Uh, versatile, that's the word I'm thinking of. Um, for example, Tech90, as I um, as I was talking about, you can use it in all types of different um, situations. I think I, I may as well I give you a picture here of um, uh, Tech Cable. It's um, as it's as it is generally referred to. Um, okay, here. So here's a good picture. This is a three conductor Tech90. Um, so you can see that it has the three interior conductors. It's got this extruded plastic sheath around those conductors. So whenever we say uh, a three conductor cable, we always say the um, ground wire is always implied that it is included. So you've got the plastic interior plastic sheath. You've got this the armor here. So this is like a, the kind of the wavy um, spiral wrap aluminum armor that I was talking about. And then you have an overall um, plastic sheath and this can tech cable can be used in a, a super wide range of um, situations it can be used in um, mechanical uh, where it's subject to mechanical damage underground underwater even in hazardous locations all kinds of um, all kinds of good stuff so super useful to have around if you need to install some wire uh, so that's section 12 protection and control is section 14 so this covers how to use circuit breakers fuses um, controlling uh, like how to use switches to control loads. And most of us, I'm sure, will be familiar with, um, you know, the circuit breakers in your house and that sort of thing, fuses. Fuses are just um, protective devices that have to be replaced every time they blow. They have a, a essentially a metal element on the inside that is um, that 
uh, it, it is something that is designed to blow up when you have a, a, a current um, running through it that's too high. The circuit breaker does that, except it's resettable. It, it, uh, it trips uh, essentially either a thermal or a magnetic element that opens a, a switch, basically, and then you can reset that. So, yeah, four second fourteen here, general requirements, um, overcurrent, product, uh, overcurrent protections. This kind of lays out the theory of how overcurrent protection is done, ground fault protection, um, rating of devices, and all that sort of stuff. So there's lots of rules on how devices are rated. There's certain situations where you need to use a more conservative rating than others, um, and that sort of thing. I should also mention just briefly here that protection of um, electrical on electrical circuit is not there to protect the load and it's in, in the exception of ground fault protection, which can be there to protect either the load or you. It's not there to protect you as well. The circuit breakers and the fuses that we have are really to protect the wiring and that is for fire prevention. So as I was saying before, you run too much current through the wire, it gets too hot and you, you know, you can, you can have a fire. So that's, that is really the purpose of overcurrent protection and circuit breakers. It's not to protect the load, it's not to protect you. If you get shocked by a, you know, a wire, even a, a normal 15 amp circuit breaker, it's, you're gonna be dead a long time before that circuit breaker is gonna trip. So um, if ever, if the circuit breaker might never trip. Um, so it is really there to protect the cables and the wiring for the purpose of protecting the building. And that's why we use ground fault protection in, um, in bathrooms or where there might be water present, like in kitchens, um, to protect you if somehow the device you're using comes in contact with water and gives you a shock, then you will be protected. So I'm not going to cover ground fault protection here, um, really, but that is the purpose. It's, to, it's for people protection. Circuit breakers are for kind of building and wiring protection. Section 16 is low voltage circuits, class 1 and class 2. I have really never used section 16 before. It um, like can cover communication circuits. Uh, control circuits where you might have like a wiring from a, a sensor or some sort of instrumentation in a plant um, back to a PLC or some other sort of controller. Um, I should I, I say not often encountered. I've not often encountered it. You might be in a, in a position where you're doing instrumentation and controls work and you're doing section 16 stuff or you need to know section 16 for the work you do every day. So take that with a grain of salt. This is, my, I guess, my experience that I'm writing both here. Maybe I shouldn't do that, but then that's, uh, that's my experience is on class one and class two circuits. It's on low voltage circuits. So section 16 defines what those circuits are. Um, they're essentially low voltage, low power circuits where you have, you know, maybe 30 volts at not more than a um, one KVA or 150 volts at is a class one circuit or class two, I think goes up to up to 150 volts, but at not more than 100 volt amps. So section 26 is the last general section and it covers the installation equipment such as, well, pretty much everything under the sun. Fuses, disconnect switches, transformers, capacitors, panel boards, branch circuits, receptacles, receptacles and dwellings. It's, it's really a big, another big section. Um, and it is again, one of those ones that's used more so for electricians. Um, so it, as I have here, it says essentially, it's how to install blank, what sizes are permitted and how many to put on a circuit, all that sort of stuff. So now this being said, um, it also, section 26 also covers a lot of rules for um, the rating of overcurrent devices. For example, transformers. Um, there's a lot of rules in section 26 on transformers. So for example, I'll take a look at this here. Um, transformers. So uh, these are all different types of transformers, different installation types of transformers, and it's um, 26, 250, 26, 252, um, 254, 256 are kind of the main ones that um, set the overcurrent protection that you, if you are designing a system with transformers that you need to look at. It is confusing, but you need to know them for designing the um, opacity of the primary circuit breaker uh, that is feeding a transformer or the secondary um, side circuit breaker that is feeding the downstream load. Sometimes you need both, sometimes you only need one. Um, sorry, yes, Brandon. I thought I had that on. I apologize for my, my fan here. Uh, okay, high noise suppression. Hopefully that is better. 
apologies for that. I know my fan is really, I, it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's dumb. It's, you know what, I might be able to unplug that. If I unplug, it's, my thing is fully charged here. Hopefully, unplugged it. Better now. Okay, <laughs> great. Oh, sorry about that. Okay. Um, all right, so that's section 26. Now, of course, it's not just transformers. Don't get me wrong, it's all kinds of things. Fences, interestingly, they put that first. <laughs> Almost first, like electrical fences for deer and stuff. Um, cows. Uh, so yeah, there's a bunch of stuff in here. Like I said, a lot of it has to do with the installation of the equipment. You know, like, you know, don't make the bending of the wire too sharp or that sort of thing. Don't, you know, don't tape wires or something, you know, whatever it is. A lot of this has to do with, again, the installation. It's not so much the design, except for that section of Transformers. But that that is not a general thing. There's also a bunch of stuff here on, you know, how many, how many receptacles you can have on a branch circuit, what installation um, configuration they should be in. So uh, when you're doing... Uh, you know, a big commercial job or something like that, you, uh, a consultant is doing that, and they're going to have a um, one or multiple details sheets that are going to have details of this receptacle should be installed in this certain sort of way, and that would have to match what's in section 26 here. So, yeah, so that is the general sections. Other important sections that are now, so now these are the amending sections, hazardous locations, very important for um, distilleries, uh, petroleum refinery facilities, um, petroleum storage facilities, all, all kinds of facilities, um, sewage uh, treatment plants, that sort of thing that have, um, uh, there's where there's gases that are flammable, patient care areas or hospitals, motors and generators, fire alarms, fixed electric heating, renewable energy, electric vehicles. So that's just a brief overview of some of the ones that you might come into contact more, with a little bit more. Um, I've actually don't think I've ever used renewable energy systems or electric vehicle sections, but just wanted to highlight them that the code does have a fair bit of um, rules for installation of, for example, solar systems um, and how to how to install them safely, how to the, the maximum voltage is permitted, and all that sort of stuff. I've never actually used it to design um, a system, but it's there if if the need were ever to arise. Definitely, section twenty eight for motors very important, and um, if you're doing hazardous locations design. Um, actually, sections 18, 20, and 22 all have um, some something to say about some sort of, you know, hazardous location, corrosive areas, flammable liquid areas, that sort of thing. So in hazardous locations, you need cables, uh, fittings, electrical boxes, receptacles, you name it, lights that are actually rated for explosions to happen. So, or they're supposed to keep out explosions. If an explosion was to happen inside the electrical system, in the conduits or something like that, it should not let the the explosive gases and the fire spread to other areas to kind of try to contain um, the risk. So the, now we get to the tables. So we just covered the sections, which are essentially zero to 86. And now we get to the tables. So there are 64 tables and some of them have like six a, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J, K, for example. So there's lots of tables. They all list various information. Oops. Um, all list variable, very, um, various information. Okay, 69 actually. Um, that is used for, for, uh, for designing various um, systems. Ampacities, like I was talking about, table one, two, three, four are very important. Um, table six is the number of different types of conductors that can be used in a tubing. And the um, table nine is cross-sectional areas. Table 10 is um, conduit fill and that sort of thing. So lots of different information here, very important. And you'll, you know, if you're using the code every day, you're gonna be referring back to the tables all the time to get information. Um, so again, where all the actual data is. So a, a quick note about appendix B here. Uh, appendix B is notes. So this is kind of like the handbook. It's kind of weird that they in include this in the um, in the actual code. So if you ever if you don't want to buy the handbook, but you still want to get a little bit of more information on 
not every single rule, but some of the rules, there is kind of a hodgepodge of rules. Well, it's, it's, Appendix B is pretty long. There's a lot of rules covered, but it's slightly a hodgepodge of rules that is covered here um, in Appendix B for um, if you have a question about a rule or if there's some something you're, you're, you're wondering about, you can go to Appendix B and it might get answered there. So there's also some, um, and in some cases, some diagrams in Appendix B for um, what's going on. Appendix D, tabulated general information, is also very important and very useful. Um, there's a number of tables in here that are used all the time. Tables D8A to D11B are used for um, finding the ampacities of large feeder cables and conductors that are installed underground. For example, table D, um, D3 here is uh, kind of uh, a table for calculating voltage drop. This is kind of like a standardized table um, with some distance correction factors that you can use for various um, currents and sizes of wiring. And you can see how long can you go for X voltage drop. In this case, it's 1%, but then you can multiply this to get 2, 3, 4%, whatever you need. Um, another great table and table in the D section is table D16. Uh, and Here. Table D16, now this is to the side, and this gives you your um, circuit breaker sizes for various types of motors. And you'd use that very frequently if you were designing um, circuits with motors on them. So we'll do one calculation example to wrap um, things up here. I don't want to take up too much of the time. I know it's midterm season right now. So um, this is an example where you have two different circuits in one conduit. And I did that so we can see, so we can actually um, apply some of the D rating factors, the correction factors. So you have a 75 amp three phase delta load at 208 volts and a 50 amp single phase um, 208 volt load. So it's picking off two of the phases. Um, and that needs to be fed using one conduit. And the ambient temperature is 40 degrees Celsius. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to go to, um, uh, for your general use, we're going to go to table. Um, two or table four to get your con to get your um, your value. Now tables two and four are for are for um, okay, so here's table two. Um, not more than three insulated copper conductors in a rate sway. So again, under five thousand volts. This is low voltage and unshielded in a rate sway cable. So your average everyday kind of cable tech ninety. For example, it can be anything um, not that is less than 5,000 volts um, in a raceway, which is a raceway is just a fancy way of saying a conduit or a cable. So you're going to, and this is for copper. Table four is the same, same thing, but for aluminum. So I said to do, to look for both copper and aluminum, I will leave aluminum as an exercise if you'd like to do that, but we'll do so copper together. So for copper, so one load is 75 amps, one load is um, 50 amps. So the first thing we have to think of, uh, take a look at is what is the temperature rating that we're using. So most all wires that are sold today have an insulation temperature rating of 90 degrees. You're going to see RW90, uh, NMD90, Tech90, that sort of thing. The 90 refers to that the insulation has a maximum temperature of 90 degrees Celsius. Now, that can be a bit of a misnomer or a, um, can be a little bit confusing because while that's good that the, the insulation has a temperature rating of 90 degrees Celsius, the electrical equipment that you're terminating it to, almost in every single case, will have a maximum temperature rating of 75 degrees Celsius. And you have to use, as I'm sure some of you are going to be, I know, if you use, you have to look at your boundary conditions and you have to kind of rate your system to the most limiting or most conservative boundary condition. So in this case, of course, it's 75 degrees. So we have to use wire the ampacity values off of the 75 degrees column. Um, and you'll just get used to doing that if you go to table two. All these other the columns are not really used very often, except in some special cases. Um, and you're going to pick the 75 degrees table. Now, if there's a piece of electrical equipment that has a 60 degree termination, or maybe there's some other rule in the code, there's a bunch of rules here that you have to follow. You have to look at when you're using this table. There's some other rule in the code that's um, 
or the equipment that you're using is actually only rated for 60 degrees Celsius, then you have to use the, the rating off of the 60 degree column. But in general, we pick 75. So for the 75 amp load, well, we have to go to the next highest one here, which is you know between 65 and, and 85. So we're picking a number four PWG wire for American you know, wire gauge, which is the common gauge, the four gauge wire, number four wire. And for the 50 amp load, we can use a number eight wire. Um, so that's great. So now we have our two wires. So we're going to have, so, and at the end of the day, we're going to have two number eight wires, three number four wires. So five wires, two different sizes. But we have to take a look. Now we have to consider our correction factors. First is the ambient temperature. I said that we are looking at um, uh, 40 degree ambient. So this is one case that you can actually use the, the, the 90 that's in those, those conductor temperatures. Not all, again, not all conductors are 90 degrees. Some of them are 75 or even old ones might be 60 that you might see around. Um, and often when a conductor gets wet, it's derated to either 60 or 75. But in general, we're using 90 degrees. This is a dry situation. At 40 degrees, we have to apply a 0.91 insulation um, correction factor. So applying, um, taking that into account and going back here to table number two, uh, we're applying point, so I'll do the calculation here, 0.91 times 85 is 77.35. So we're fine there. We can still use in that number four for our 75 amp load, but eight amps, uh, sorry, eight gauge, 50 amps, we're right on the cup, right on the cusp. So obviously 50 times 0 0.91 is gonna be less than 50, 45 and a half. So we have to go up a size. We know to go to 65 and taking off 10% of 65 is um, much more than 50. So we're good with, so now that higher ambient temperature has to, uh, has forced us to derate our wires. This table is for 30 degrees Celsius. If you're installing this in Antarctica where it never goes for some reason you were using the CEC in Antarctica, where the temperature, you know, I don't know, never goes above minus five or something, then you can, you don't have to worry about this at all. You can, these all these all these ratings pretty much double, honestly, if, if the installation is always in super cold, um, you're gonna get a lot more, actually gonna get a lot more performance out of your wires, but you're not allowed to actually take use of that. Um, you're not allowed to up, upgrade below, above these, these, um, these values, but, your voltage drop um, will will go way down in that situation. In any case, now we know we have two number six wires and three number four wires. What's next? Now we have to look at the correction factors for um, the number of insulated conductors in the tables two and four. Oh shoot! Now we have another ampacity correction factor. So we have we know we have five insulated conductors in our wire. The ground wire that we're going to pull in along with those other five wires doesn't count in the, in this um, number here because it doesn't, it should not in a normal situation have any current running through it. So it doesn't count. So actually we have to apply a further 80% correction factor, 20% derating to our table. Here. So that is going to, so now we have our 77.35 times 8 is going to be 61. That's what was way down. So actually, we have to go up even further. 100, a number three conductor. So 100 times 0 0.91, applying our temperature derating factor times 0 0.8 is 72.8. Oh, wow, even that's too low. Go up another one, number two. That's 83.72. So we have to, you, you see here, we've gone up all, you know, two. Two numbers, two wire sizes. It's not. Uh, I don't think it's number two is not quite double a number four, but it's it's a fair bit bigger, which means of course more cost. But that's we're forced to do that because again we have to ensure that we're doing things safely um, and and taking into account the temperature rise that is going to occur in the wiring because there's all these wires that are close together. So we'd have to apply the same problem to uh, do the 65. Um, degrees, so 65 times 8, 47.32. So now we actually have to install a number four for that one. Yeah, and we're fine for that. We give that 61 amps. So 
we actually are now going to be installing after applying those two correction factors. So this kind of goes, shows you here this iterative design that we have to go through to, to pick our wire sizes. Three number two wires and, and, um, and two number four wires plus our ground wire, which is uh, number two. The ground wire is always matched to the, um, the biggest conductor in your, um, in your system. But even though we're pulling two circuits, we don't have to pull two ground wires. We just have to pull one as long as it's matched to the biggest wire that you're pulling. Uh, into your cable. So the next uh, step is to go off to uh, to see how many, what size of conduit do we need? So that's the other thing that I've asked for. So the first thing that you need to know um, is the, uh, so I'll make a comment here that this has changed somewhat significantly between the this calculation that we're doing now for the conduit fill has changed the, the amount of wires going to a conduit is called conduit fill. Um, the, the amount, so the calculation for conduit fill has changed pretty significantly between the 2018 and the 2021 code. It's now, so it's now a more general calculation, but it is, it takes a little bit longer. Um, but we'll do it via the old way because it's actually a little bit easier. So we're using um, RW90 wiring. I didn't, I don't know if I actually said that, but that's what, we're, what, we, what we'll be using. Um, so it's really easy to use. So this table is not does not really exist anymore. What you have to do now is you have to look up what is the um, cross sectional area of each of your wires. Um, how many? What's the maximum fill for a conduit? You add up the the cross sectional area for your wire. You derate the conduit size by the maximum fill depending on how many wires there are in the conduit, and then you can via the sizes of conduits that are provided you calculate, okay, what's the what's the conduit size I need? In this case, what we're gonna do is we're just gonna go um, by this chart here, which is the old way of doing it. A little bit easier, but um, has these these edge cases, or not edge cases, I suppose, but these cases where we have two different sizes of wires, like we're, I'm, I'm gonna go through right now, um, where you need to do that other calculation to begin with. So we, we know that we have what did I say? Three number twos and two number fours. So three number twos, we're, no, we're looking at at least a 35 millimeter trade size conduit. Um, and for comparison, two number fours, we would need at least a 27 trade size conduit. So uh, this is half inch, three quarter, one inch, one and a quarter, one and a half, etc. cetera. Um, that's the metric to imperial trade size uh, conversions. So we know that, well, so now what do we do? Because we've got these two different sizes as well. What do we do? What we could do if we we, we don't want a penny pinch, a way of approximating it, maybe not the most exact way, is we just say, well, just approximate these number fours as number twos. You only have to go up one size to 41. Instead of doing all this math, we could just approximate. If you had a bunch of, four, for some reason, 400 KC mil and number eights in the same conduit, you're not going to want to approximate your number eights as... 400. But for this case, the number two, number four, it's pretty close. And this, in this sense already, like there's no, there's no three conductors here, right? We have to go up to another one. Now, mind you, we actually have to account for four, um, for, 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 for six number, number twos. So we would actually have to go up to this 53 or two inch um, trade size conduit. But, so this may be a, a case where we want to calculate um, the actual, the complete um, size. So what we would have to do in that case uh, is go down to the cross-sectional areas of the um, stranded insulate conductors, table 10A here, RW90 XLPE for uh, 600 volts. We are gonna take, uh, I'm not going to do the calculation here, but I suppose I could. Uh, we're gonna assume an insulated ground conductor. Um, so 73.85 times, um, Four, including the ground conductor, plus we have two number fours, 52.46, and this is in millimeters squared, times two. 400.432 is the, um, uh, the the number there that we have to, we have to go to. So this is table A from here. Now, I'm looking, what I'm looking for here is a, uh, the, now this is changed in, between this table and the last table, but there's a D rating table, like I had mentioned, for um, 
here, table eight, this is what I want. So maximum percent conduit and tubing fill. So we have our number and we know that, um, so this is 400, so we have this like, let's just say 400, 400 square millimeters. And there's, we have over four. So we don't have lead sheets. So this 400 square millimeters can only represent 40% of the size of the table. So if we size that up, divided by 0.4, so we actually need a 1,000 millimeters squared. That actually worked out pretty nicely. 1,000 millimeters squared worth of conduit size. Uh, let's pick um, uh, electrical metallic tubing, or EMT. That's a pretty commonly used conduit in, um, in the, the industry. And we're going to go, uh, here we go. So, Yes, non-metallic and metallic. So excuse me for a second. So we're on we're on the forty percent um, size, and they've actually derated this already for you. So they've already taken what's forty percent of a hundred percent here. So we can actually look at either a thousand on this column or four hundred on this column. So in either case, we're actually going to be using a forty-one uh, conduit size. So in this case, we actually save we're able to downsize one conduit size because I said before if we had assumed everything was a number two taking that approximation we would have had to use um, a 53 conduit size but we don't have to do that we we're actually able to go down to a 41 um, for the for the purposes of this uh, this calculation so that's an, a bit of an example of how you would go about calculating your uh, your conduit um, your conduit size so yeah, I don't, um, I think that's, well, that's all I have for my, um, what I had planned to um, talk about here. So um, I would now, I think, open the floor to questions. Um, already uh, spoken for about 80 minutes here. So uh, yeah, yeah, if anybody, hopefully everybody uh, um, liked that, there, that is the, my presentation. Um, there's definitely lots more to learn about the code if you want to go into that. Um, if any more questions about something more advanced or I want to talk a little bit about more, I'd um, be happy to do that. But uh, yeah, thanks everybody for coming out and I hope you enjoyed it. And I guess we can...